All right. Are you ready? This is chapter number two. And chapter number two is we're talking about stepping into love, rediscovering, reclaiming our personal power. Last week we talked about the idea of what is love, but in order to know what love is, you've got to know first, who are you? That's a question you know, philosophers have been asking for years. Who am I? Plato, Socrates, Plotinus, everyone's been asking that question, who am I? You have probably been asking that question too. And today we're going to explore this question differently. And I want you to just really pay attention, but I really want you to be open to seeing it differently than what you've been seeing it all of your life. Okay? So we're going to go back and I'm going to talk about what is the definition of love. This is one of the definitions that I came up with. Love is the awareness and acceptance of our wholeness. Really think about that. It's about the awareness and acceptance that we're already perfect and whole. We've been taught to th think that we are missing something. I know, I remember so clearly getting married, and people would come up and say, so where's your better half? And I would rebel against that. What do you mean better half? This is the better half. <laughs> do you know why this is the better half? Because it's the only half I'm responsible for. Do you get that? In a relationship, you are responsible for one thing and one thing only, and that is who you are. You are not responsible for the other person. They're responsible for that. We've been taught, no, I got to change my partner. I got to do this. No, that's their job if they even want it. So you're responsible for yourself. So it's about the awareness, acceptance that you're whole already. Realize that who you are today, you created by the conscious and unconscious thoughts that you've had in your life up till this time. Truly fascinating. That's who you are. The mental atmosphere that you've created in your life to this point is the man or woman that you are. And you can change that to become different if you so choose. I went on and said self-love is a never-ending process of expanding our personal power. It's a process of we never get to the point where we realize the fullness of all that we are because the fullness of all that we are is infinite. Right? How do you get to the point of knowing infinite? When you know infinite, you're beyond the senses. You're in a world where you don't, you don't even know you exist. When you're in that deep state of meditation that is tapped into the infinite, everything disappears. So when someone says to you, wow, I was in the deepest meditation. Let me tell you what it was like and what I felt like. That is not the deepest meditation. That's a, a sleep dream that's happening. In the deepest space of meditation, there's nothing. You don't exist. You blended back into the allness that is life. And so we then go on. It is the acceptance and expansion of our awareness that we are already whole and perfect. We're already whole and perfect. There's nothing we have to become. We're already whole and perfect. And then it goes, when we self-love, we become inspired, engaged, empowered, fulfilled, and free. Think about that. When you truly are in love, you are engaged in life. You are empowered in life. You're inspired from within, and you're free. The single one thing that we want most in the world is to feel free. Think about that. Anytime we rebel, it's because we do not feel free. So let's go on. Who am I? Let's go back to the very premise that all religion, spirituality talk about, quantum physics, there is one. Quantum physics calls it the quantum field. Religion calls it the allness of God, the infinite nature of God. Okay? Science says there's a, uh, a universal underlying power and principle in the universe. So when we talk about that there's only one and it's infinite, if there's only one and it's infinite, it means that everything that has been ever created was created by it, out of it. Do you get that? So that means you 
are an individualized expression of the infinite. You are created by the infinite. And so I guess the best analogy would be is you're a drop in the ocean. And as a drop in the ocean, all of the, the, the particles, everything that the ocean is, is contained in the drop that you are. But you're not all the ocean. You're a drop within the ocean. Does that make sense? So everything that God is, all the aspects of God, the infinite, are present within us. You are a microcosm of the macrocosm. And I think I talked about this a couple weeks ago. The idea that there are 50 to 100 trillion cells in your body. Think about 50 to 100 trillion cells in your body. And your mind that you don't even know about, the unconscious aspect of your mind is causing those cells to be, to be killed off, to be recreated. It's causing your digestion to happen, your circulation to happen, your nervous system to happen. Everything that's happening in your body is happening within your mind. You are actually the individualized mind of God of your body. So you are the God of your own body. So when we get into a state of disconnection, what's disconnection? Disconnection shows up as stress. Stress is the lack of understanding that you are already a part of the infinite. Because if you understand you're part of the infinite, you don't have stress. And if you don't have stress, then your body will be in a state of homeostasis. If you have stress, that's when the body weakens down. That happened for me in last June. I didn't realize I was stressing, and because I was in a stressful state for so long, my immune system broke down, and I got pneumonia. Who was responsible for me getting pneumonia? I was. I was not a victim because I'm the one who didn't manage my stress. I was unaware, and that's what happens to us. So we don't have to beat ourselves up. We have to realize that whatever's out picturing, it's a sign that something internal is going on. That's really the key thing. Our outpicturing in life tells us something is going on inside and we have the ability to change whatever that is. So you're a microcosm of the macrocosm, which means this infinite macrocosm that created everything, you have the same power within you to create your life experience. The question is, are you going to be conscious enough to use it? We live as a paradox isn't that a great idea? We live as a paradox. It doesn't make sense. We are both the observer and the observed. We are the witness and the experiencer of our lives. That's a tough one. That's a really tough one to understand because we get with our egos, we get locked into the aspect that the experiencer is all that we are. And what we do is when we get into the meditation practice, when we develop a really deep, sound meditation practice, that's when we finally start to become the observer of our lives. For me, that really became apparent in 2013 when I went to India into Upper Uttarkashi and was doing a 16-day silent meditation retreat with Kriya Yoga. And we were like five days into the retreat and all of a sudden, the main moderator broke silence and basically said, the rain is started, it is a monsoon, we could be in for floods beyond things that we can control. But there was nothing we could do about it. Well, guess what happened? We got caught in the worst flooding in a hundred years in the history of that area of India. We literally watched the toll bridge that went across, not the toll bridge, the suspension bridge that went across the Ganga River get wiped out. We watched the Ganga River go from 30 yards wide to over 250 yards wide. We were watching houses that were 50, 60, 70 feet above the river fall into the river as the river ate away the banks. We found out afterwards that 100,000 people were left homeless, 6,000 people died. We were in an ashram on the wrong side of the river. 
And I can remember being there with my friend Naranjan, who I'd met there, and we got, um, we had a, a solar thing. So we were able to, with uh, the Swami had a phone that he could charge on the thing and could get out, and we found out that it wasn't a monsoon, it was a freak storm that we were in, and the monsoons were going to start in two days. And I can remember looking at Naranjan, and I says, we've got to take this under our own power now. If we stay here, we could die. And I can remember that they didn't want us to leave, that we were told we had to sit still. And I looked at Naranjan and I says, I'm not sitting still. My spirit says to do something. And so Naranjan and I, we hired this 21-year-old man, five foot six, five foot five, 120 pounds, but he knew the ropes. And so he took us across the Himalayas, about 750 to 1,000 feet above the river, where it's like this, going down, and it was all wet, and there were many times that I would start to slide and he would reach and grab my hand and stop me. Naranjan, who's 6'3", bigger than man than I am, he would start to slide. This little guy grab his hand. And the amazing thing was, we went four hours, got to where the army base was, and talked to the captain. And he says, we can't come and get you. There's no helicopter that we can bring in there. There's no place for it. You're going to have to bring all 40 people here for us to helicopter you to safety. And so Naranjan and I then had to go back. Think about that. Four more hours, and it was dark. And you know what was funny? I had zero fear. At that point, something happened because of my meditation practice that I stepped out of my body, and I observed myself doing the dance, the walk of life. I'd never had that experience before to that level. And I attributed it to the fact that I was able to meditate. I was able to detach from my ego. Because what happens when you're attached to your ego? Fear. Every time you're feeling fear, it's your ego that's causing you to feel fear. Your ego is saying you're not enough. You're not whole. You're not perfect. You don't have what it takes. When you can detach from the ego, you become the observer. That's power. So at that moment... I got to experience it. And let me tell you, when I got back to the ashram where we were at after eight hours of hiking, I was the most tired, beat up, sore, physically drained individual I have ever been. And the next day, we did it again to get out, all 40 of us, and we made it. But it was the observer, it was tapping into that that stopped the fear. When you're in the, the experiencer, you've got the fear. See, the observer doesn't judge. It sees each and every situation in balance. So here's what I understand. You are never given something more than you can deal with it, that you can deal with. So whatever happened in Uttarkashi that year, I was prepared to deal with. I said to myself, isn't it great that I take physical fitness so seriously? Isn't it great that I didn't have the body at that time? That would have been um, 2013. That would have been seven years ago. That would have meant I was 61 years of age. I was the oldest person on this journey. And yet I was a leader. I didn't buy into the race consciousness that you get old and you can't do things. Your body temple is an expression of God and you have the power to have a body that allows you to, to live the life that you want. But you've got to be conscious of it and you've got to take the action mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically to become that person. And the idea is meditation takes you to a point where everything is in balance. You see, the illusion we have bought into is that there's a one-sided life. The pursuit of happiness. It is the opioid of the masses. It causes all depression, anxiety. It's the cause of all our mental illness because we are trying to reach to a goal that is impossible. We have to learn to set our own goals in our lives. Goals that mean something to us. The observer is the part of us that gets to choose what it wants to experience. It's that aspect that looks at life and says, okay, what does Lee Wallach want in life? What brings juice to Lee Wallach? These are questions you should be asking yourself. What juicy, what do you love to do? What is it you want to do more of? We are always that choice whether we choose consciously or unconsciously. Do you get that? 
we are always at choice. Most of the time, our choices are unconscious. We bought into the idea that our parents are right, our schools are right, our politicians are right, our religious leaders are right, and we've given up our power to other people instead of going within and being uniquely you. The question is, think about this. Think about there's an infinite that has no limitations, and it's going to create everything out of itself, right? Everything out of itself. Would it create two of the exact same thing? No. No it would create everything uniquely. There's not two snowflakes in the world that are alike. There's not two grains of sand that are alike. There are not two human beings that are alike. So each of us is unique. And we came here to have our own unique experience in this life. And we were given the five senses, we were given a mind that can create, and we are here to express and be that uniqueness. What makes you unique? What makes you different? The hierarchy of our values controls our experience in life and makes us unique. Too often, however, we have not clearly defined our values and therefore our experiences are not what we want. We just did the values workshop. This is something I learned thoroughly and totally from Dr. John D. Martini. I give him all the credit in this. Until I understood the hierarchy of my values, I was living by the values of my mom, my dad, my religion, by society. I was not living Lee Wallach's values. Once I understood my values, I became powerful within myself because that's where the power exists. Our values are those areas of our lives where we perceive there is a void or something missing. So how does that look? My number one value is spiritual self-actualization. It's that because spirit is infinite, which means there can be an infinite experience of spirit, which means even though I've lived all these years, I've had all these experiences, I haven't even cracked the surface of what is available. So there's more there, right? I want to learn about human behavior. That's my number three value. Guess what? Human behavior, there's seven and a half billion people. There's a lot of quirkiness out there. Call it anything you want, but I want to learn about it. I love studying human behavior. I love teaching and speaking about how to better self-love, number two value. I love building intimate relationships and community. See, notice all my values. There's more than I can achieve, right? Health and well-being is my, my fourth value or my fifth value. I don't want to be a person who goes through life and can't do what he wants to do physically. I want to accomplish everything I do physically. I also want to be financially free to do what I want, when I want, how I want. I don't want to be limited by money. My last value is I want to travel and experience the world in ways that excite me. That's why I'm going back to the Himalayas in May. Why I'm going to defy the odds. I'm told that you can't be over 55 to do this trek. I talked to the tour owner this week and said, based on what you're doing, we see no reason why you can't do it. See, I didn't accept the rules. And that's the purpose of what I'm trying to tell you. You've got to be a rule breaker. You've got to realize that rules are set for the average. If if you truly have claimed your uniqueness, you're not average. But if you're not average, you can't accept limitation. You have to go beyond that. To truly live a meaningful and purposeful life, we must know our values and we make them the basis of every decision we make. So when I'm making a decision, I go down my six, seven values, and I say, does it feed it? Does it feed it? Does it feed it? Does it feed it? If I can't get a yes, I'm not, I'm not going to say no. And then I have to look at it in priority. How do I prioritize? Because why? If you're not prioritizing, what's your most valuable asset, folks? It's your time. Your time is your most valuable aspect, asset. And you've got to say no to things that are not serving you. Or you've got to find a way to consolidate that. I did that with someone who called me the other day. They wanted some of my time. I said, great. Can we do this? I looked at my schedule. No, that would take me an extra hour and a half of driving. That's wasted time. So what we did is we worked out where I was already going to be in the area. So I'm not wasting time. Does that make sense? And then schedule it. You have to say no to find the right yes. The yes that serves your highest values. 
To live consciously is our greatest challenge, and this is the work. It's also where we get our greatest freedom. See, here's the thing. If you're living according to the hierarchy of your values, you don't have to be motivated from, with, from outside. You're inspired from inside. No one has to get you to do it. No one has to wake me up to meditate at 5.30 in the morning. No one. I just do it. No one has to get me up to cook for myself and make great food. No one has to get me up to go to the gym and work out. No one has to get me up to do my prayer work. No one has to get me up to study. No one has to get me up to teach, to speak. None of that. Now, this week I spent two and a half days getting ready for income tax. Now, I had to work at that one. I'm going to tell you because remember, I have a value of being financially free to do what I want, when I want, how I want, right? I had to link that getting my income taxes done this year because I've changed a lot of things that if I get this done, I'm going to have more money. So I spent the time and I did it, and I, it is magnificent. Wait till my accountant sees it. He's going to go, whoa, you're the most prepared person in the world. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. If you don't know every detail about your money habits, you will never have a lot of money. Money will always be evading you. Here's an interesting thing. When you look at your credit card, anyone use a credit card? We all do, right? I went through and I printed all of 2019 for the two credit cards that I have. And there's one that I use all the time. And in going through it, I realized I was still paying for a service that I stopped using a year ago. Did you ever get that? So it takes, you've got to look at it. And, and do you know where I spent a lot of money? On food. You know what's fascinating? I realized as I looked at it, I'm in the grocery store five days a week on average. I was talking to my friend Naranj and I said, Naranj, I just found out I'm in the grocery store five days a week. I love going to the grocery store. He says, Lee, so do I. <laughs> so we have that. And we love going in and finding the fresh food, the things that are going to nourish us. What, what's what my palate want? Then I had to ask the question, was I being frivolous or was I conscious about what I was buying? I had to reframe my mind so this year I'll be more conscious. There was some frivolousness in my decision making last year. You see, let's come back to this. Love and freedom cannot be separated. Did you get that? Love and freedom cannot be separated. If you're in a relationship and you do not feel free, there's no love. Did you hear that? There's no love. It is, the, it, is, it is with this freedom that we understand and embrace the purpose of our life is this, simply this. This is it. This is the purpose of your life. To explore, create, and have fun. See, if you understand the hierarchy of your values, then from that point of view, you're going to start exploring life, find out what's going to hire, serve those values. You're going to then start creating that experience in your life. And when you create that experience, what are you going to have? loads of fun. It's fun doing what you love to do. Do you get that? It's not fun doing what you don't like to do. And we have been drilled out of the aspect from when we were kids. Today it's just so horrific that our children in kindergarten are being t giving standardized tests. Five years old. They should be having fun. They shouldn't have to learn all this stuff. Why? Does it make them happier? No. It means that he can be controlled. Five years old, you wonder why kids are being labeled as ADD and HDAD and why they're being given drugs? Because they're forced to sit in a chair all day long when they should be out playing. They say a boy that's running around in class, he's out of control. No, he's a boy playing. It's what you do. You were given a body to move, and we blindly allowed our children to be fit into this model, and we support the system that's doing it. I guess I have feelings on that, don't I? I don't want my granddaughter to go through that. 
So I'm doing my best to be an influence in her life so that she can be free to play, to explore, to expand, and most importantly, to have fun. You see, if you've got a granddaughter, some of you are too young, some of you are too old, um, but if you've got a granddaughter or grandson, your only role as a grandparent is to play and have fun. Allow them to be that youth, and here's the key thing, it allows you to be young again. That's where life is fun. Oh, so much fun. So who are you? You are the individualized expression of God. The individualized expression of the infinite. There's two aspects of you. There is the observer and there is the experiencer. You're both at the same time. My invitation to you is stop looking outside yourself for your fulfillment and realize that everything you are seeking is in you. It has always been in you. And what we're doing here is we're awakening to this truth of who we are. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm so grateful that you took your time to watch or listen to this message. If you found this message beneficial, I would ask that you go to our website, agapecsl.com. Once there, click on the donate button and experience the joy of conscious and purposeful giving. Or if you would like, text your gift by simply dialing 972-532-6976. It is through your gifts that we are able to bring this message to you in the world. I would ask that if you like this message, to please subscribe to my YouTube channel under my name, Lee Wallach. Again, I want to thank you for joining me in the Gopi community as we learn how to better self-love through conscious living.